So welcome to this audio lecture wrapping up factorial MANOVA and MANOVAs in general. Um, so factorial MANOVA uses the same multivariate statistics as single factor MANOVA and requires the same interpretations as univariate factorial ANOVA. Effectively again we're adding a layer to the onion and compared to if we're doing a MANOVA with only a single IV where we're not looking for an interaction Again, we're going to have to look at each individual DV if there's the overall omnibus MANOVA. So if that MANOVA is significant, that Wilkes lambda is below P of 0 0.05. Past that, we're then going to look at what is the main effect of that one IV on each and every DV. And if that IV has three or more levels, we'll also have to do post hoc testing for each one of those DVs. Now, if we have multiple IVs, we're not only going to have, again, those main effects to look at, we're going to have every possible interaction to examine as well. So again, with those interactions, we're looking at simple main effects. Um, so in this case, we have more than one categorical predictor variable and more than one continuous outcome variable. So again, we have multiple DVs, outcome variables, that's why we're doing MANOVA. We also have categorical predictors, again while we're using MANOVA instead of, for example, a multiple regression, and again we have more than one of those categorical predictors. Because of the number of variables, the design statistic interpretations are more complex, but this complexity really is just a layered complexity. Um, it's nothing more than what we've done before, it's just we're combining it all into a single test. So any significant interactions will require simple main effect tests to find out exactly what's going on, and each one of those will have to be done for each outcome variable. So for example, in a very simple factorial MANOVA, a 2 by 2 factorial MANOVA with two DVs. So again, we have about the simplest factorial MANOVA we could possibly design. We have two categorical predictors, each with two levels, and we have two continuous outcome variables. Now, we're going to have a single interaction, but if that interaction is significant, we're also going to have to see is it significant with the first DV, and is it significant with the second DV. And for each DV that it's significant in, we're also then going to have to do the simple main effect test to find out exactly where are those differences. So let's talk a little bit about the advantages and disadvantages of MANOVA. Um, so generally speaking, we do need a larger N every time we're adding variables to a statistical design, whether they're independent variables, IVs, whether they're predictors, IVs, or whether they're outcomes, DVs, we generally need more sample size. Um, so generally speaking, the rule of thumb is that whatever the sample size is that we need for ANOVA, we need to times that sample size by the number of DVs that we now have. So for example, we generally wanted to see 10 plus people in every cell within an ANOVA. So a 2 by 2 design has effectively 4 cells, 2 by 2, so that's 40. If we had 2 DVs, we'd want 80. If we had 3 DVs, we'd want again 120. And again, this is a bare minimum. Um, also, just as a general note, when we're looking at the MANOVA, um, we also want to be very aware of any smaller sample sizes. Because a lot of times what will happen is we make a complex design for example, if we're collecting data um, at random from a population and where some of those DVs or some of those independent variables are variables within the population itself. So let's, for example, say that you're interested in ethnicity and you're wanting to look at the differences between African Americans, European Americans, and Hispanic Americans or Latinos. So you have three categories there. Now you also have a DV of gen or an IV of gender, males versus females, and finally three or four IVs. Now, or DV, sorry, outcomes. Now, what we're looking at at that point is if there is a situation, for example, where you collect a sample that the N is large enough for this design, so it's a two by three design with three DVs. So in that case, again, we have six total cells, possible areas someone could end up with, and that's again crossing our IVs, gender, male or female, at least in this particular study, by three different ethnic, ethnic categories. So that means 10 per cell, we're wanting to see 60, and then we have three DVs. So at that point, 60 times 3, we want 180 people. So we collect 180 people. The problem there is, is that we get 120 European Americans, we might get 40 African Americans, and 20 Hispanic Americans. And then within those Hispanic Americans, we actually get 18 men and 2 women. That means one of our cells now is actually at 2. 
Hispanic women. And that's assuming that every they filled out all three DVs. Let's say one of them actually didn't fill out two of the DVs. In some of our analyses, we now have a single person in that cell. When that happens, we're usually going to find out that we violate some of the assumptions of the MANOVA. The MANOVA is going to let us know. So if you do find, and we haven't talked about the assumptions of the uh, MANOVA yet, but when your MANOVA assumptions are violated, one of the first things to look at is how many people are actually in each cell for each DV. Because though the rule of thumb is this big N, we do want to analyze and think about, well, what the rule of thumb is representing, though, is a bare minimum of 10, and ideally probably 20 plus, in each possible combination. Some additional assumptions over ANOVA. So multiclinearity, and again, remember from multiple regression, multiple clinearity is when continuous variables are too highly correlated. Same thing can occur with the MANOVA in the DVs. All the DVs are continuous and they are a part of the overall model. So if they're highly correlated, that may actually violate the assumption of the MANOVA. Uh, now again, this may show up in some of the actual statistical tests, but it's also not a bad idea to just run a correlation matrix on your DVs looking for that. Are any of them correlated at 90 or higher? So again, 0 0.90 um, R squared. So again, we have multivariate normality, and again, the multivariate normality refers to, we'll be testing this with the box M test, actually, but it's basically saying that every possible combination of both of your IVs, or however many IVs you have, and your DVs, should all be normally distributed. So this is an example that if we go back to when I was talking about the idea of having a cell with only one or two people in that cell, that multivariate normality of that one cell, so the standard deviation of that cell, the mean of that cell, very likely is going to look very different than your other cells, and that's going to stick out and probably violate this assumption. We also have to worry a little bit about multivariate outliers. So these are outliers that would not show up on any additional, any specific test. So for example, you can look at your three DVs and see that you have no outliers, but one particular cell actually ends up having extremely high scores on average across all three DVs. So the one way to look at this again is that if you have a fairly small sample size in one of your cells, what if the person that actually completed that particular cell actually scored very high on all three DVs? That becomes a multivariate outlier. The, uh, the chances of someone actually scoring highly on all of your outcomes is for probably much less likely compared to everyone else's score. And if that person also ends up in a smaller cell where that outlier has a stronger effect, this may also violate some of the assumptions of MANOVA. And finally, we have homogeneity of variance and covariance. And again, this is just looking at that multivariate combination of your IVs and DVs. Another disadvantage of the MANOVA is it's complex. Um, it's two stages of nature of effects test needed. So we're having to look at an omnibus test. We're then having to look at, quite honestly, a second omnibus test. So again, the Wilkes Lambda, the MANOVA itself, is an omnibus test of everything. But if that's significant, we're now doing ANOVA omnibus tests, F tests, to find out if we can continue. And if that is significant, then we're following up with even further tests. Finally, it can be less powerful than ANOVA if the DVs are positively correlated or uncorrelated. So basically what that means is if the DVs are too correlated or not related at all, in those cases the ANOVAs probably will be finding or more likely to find effects than the ANOVA in general. MANOVA works best when there is some variance between the DVs. In other words, there's some crossover, some explained variance between them. They're correlated, but they're not strongly positively correlated or, and they're not completely uncorrelated. And what that's doing, again, is visually it's providing additional explained variance that the MANOVA can pick up. When that is not happening, basically when the MANOVA looks for effect size just with your DVs, if it either finds it's very strong, it may basically overwhelm the effect size of your actual independent variables, and in that case the MANOVA would actually be less likely to find an effect than separate ANOVAs. Or, if it's uncorrelated at all, it basically is adding nothing to the model, but it's still eating up de degrees of freedom. It's still being added to the model, so you're taking the minus of having additional predictors, or in this case, outcomes in the model, except that they're providing no information about being correlated or related to each other. 
So the multiple methods of comparing the multivariate f exists. So again, like a lot of tests, well, you'll remember this with repeated measures ANOVAs, you weren't just getting an f test, you were getting multiple tests. So we're going to talk about these briefly, and generally speaking, what happens here is what we're talking about is the most robust, most robust test versus the most powerful test. So a robust test means if you say this is significant based on this test, you are certain that it's significant. You Basically, this test is robust to violations of the assumptions. It is basically being very cautious when it says this is what the p-value is. Most powerful means that this test is basically not really, it's very susceptible to um, violations of assumptions. So if there's anything weird going on with the data, it basically will make your p-value untrustable. But it also is much more likely to find an effect. So basically our most robust test is the Philly Bartlett's Trace. Um, our second most robust test is Ho Hotelling's T, and I remember Hotelling's T, really we're only going to use that if we have a single predictor IV that's categorical. So this is basically just allowing us to do a whole series of t-tests across a group of DVs at the time. And this is also a pretty robust test. It really doesn't, it's very, um, uh, it's not very susceptible to violations of assumptions, but it's fairly limited when we use it. Wilkes Lambda is what we're normally going to use. So that's what you're normally going to present as your omnibus test from ANOVA. It is fairly robust. Um, it will find most effect sizes, but again, we're going to find some situations where it says something's going on and there isn't. In other words, the ANOVAs that follow it say, actually, nope, there's nothing here. Or there's going to be times where Wilkes Lambda says nothing's going on, but if we stray down to look at the ANOVAs, there's some significant ANOVAs there. Um, Generally speaking, this is because of minor violations of the assumptions that's lost in this kind of very complex data analysis that's happening at this um, overview level. The one thing I will say is that if your if your assumptions are violated and there's not much and you and you take a look at what you could do to try to correct that violation and it's just basically occurring no matter what you do, one of the last things that you can do is simply not report Wilkes Lambda. Simply say some of my violate some of my assumptions in the NOVA were violated and therefore I'm replaced. I'm actually reporting uh, Phyllis Bartlett trace. We will rarely use Roy's, Roy's largest root because Roy's largest root is pretty much fishing for data. It will find effect sizes. This, it's the one that a lot of times you'll find that if Roy's, Roy's largest root is the only thing that's significant and you say, my ANOVA found effect somewhere, and then you look at all the ANOVAs, none of them found anything. Because again, Roy's largest root kind of overvalues the interaction between your DVs in its calculations. So, summing it up, we use Wilkes Lambda unless there's a violation of the assumption, in which case if there's no way that we can basically alter the data a little bit, removing outliers, um, maybe removing a cell or a predictor. So for example, again with that ethnicity example, if we, we may want to just look at the two larger groups. We may want to drop that small group of ethnicity because it's where the problem most likely is occurring. And then we rerun our analysis and see if the assumption of uh, the violation of that assumption is no longer there. However, if after looking at the data there really is either no logical or theoretical way we can change the data or alter the data, and I'm not talking about changing scores, I'm about talking about removing um, those outliers or removing that small sample size from the analysis and reporting that in our report, but if that isn't working then we're going to report Phyla's Bartlett Trace, and again the Hotelling's T is only going to be used when we have a single dichotomous independent variable with lots of DVs afterwards. So the statistical assumptions going into a little more detail here. Again, multivariate normality assumes all of the dependent variables are normally distributed. And that their interactions, in other words, how they're relating to each other. So when we look at someone's scores on all of our DVs, is that combination an outlier? Um, homogeneity of variance and covariance assume similar variance between the DVs and across all other factor levels using the multiple predictors. And again, we'll lose a box M's test to test this. And box M's test is a lot like Bartlett's test and a few other tests that we've used before. What we're looking for is we want boxes M to be insignificant. We don't want a significant box M. That means there's a significant problem with the homogeneity of variance. The variance is significantly different from cell to cell. 
homogeneity of regression. Um, there are linear relationships between each dependent variable and any covariates, and this is specifically for MANCOVA. So basically, the homogeneity of regression means that we have linear relationships between all our continuous variables. There's not curvilinear relationships. MANOVAs and MANCOVAs are not set up and can't be adjusted for nonlinear relationships. Um, and again, uh, the absence of multicollinearity. We want to make sure that our highly correlated DVs are not in this model. Not only are they redundant, they're also going to cause statistical issues and problems. So when do you use ANOVA, ANCOVA, MANOVA, and MANCOVA? So conditions which must be met to use the MANCOVA. Um, so the first thing is, again, this is kind of just big overview. Our dependent variables have to be continuous and they have to be normally distributed. And this is for any ANOVA, any ANCOVA, any MANOVA, any MANCOVA. Observation between subjects need to be independent as long as the study itself is not a repeated measures design. So again, methodologically, people in one cell should not be influencing the scores of people in another. The group variances are homogeneous, and again, that means that there's not a diff that we are expecting mean differences in those continuous outcomes. However, the distributions, how they look, outliers, um, are they skewed, are they catodic, um, all of those should be relatively the same from cell to cell. And our independent variables must be categorical. Um, they can be ordinal or nominal. However, in general, we're usually going to be using nominal data. They should not be continuous in any nature. So again, just a quick flowchart of when to use ANOVA, ANCOVA, MANCOVA, and MANOVA. So first question is how many DVs, and I'm going to just go up at the top. If we have a single DV, then we ask, are we controlling for covariates? If the answer is yes, then we ask how many IVs. If it is a single IV, so we have one DV, one IV, we're controlling for a covariate, that's a, simply an ANCOVA. If we have one DV, one IV, we're controlling for a covariate, and we have two or more IVs, we're at the factorial ANCO ANCOVA. Again, if we have a single DV, we're not controlling for a covariate, and we have a single IV, we're at ANOVA, and if we have two or more IVs, we're at factorial ANOVA. Going down the bottom of this chart, again, how many DVs? If we have two or more DVs, and again, in this case, the DVs are always going to be continuous. If they're not continuous, we shouldn't be running an ANOVA, an ANCOVA, a MANOVA, or a MANCOVA. So again, if we have two or more DVs, the next question again, are we controlling for a covariate? If the answer is yes, then again, how many IVs? If we only have a single IV, we're looking at MANCOVA. So again, we are adjusting for a, co a covariate. We have two or more DVs. We have a single IV, MANCOVA. If, again, we have multiple IVs, we're at factorial MANCOVA. And again, the bottom of the chart, same thing. It's just no longer controlling for that covariate. One IV, we're at man MANOVA. Two or more, we're at, facto at factorial MANOVA. And again, those IVs are always going to be some form of categorical IVs. So again, the MANOVA flowchart. In SPSS, we're going to use SPSS to run MANOVA. So we're looking for that omnibus Wilkes Lambda test. We're also checking for our assumptions. We're making sure there isn't any violations. If that MANOVA's Wilkes Lambda is significant, we're going to examine the specific ANOVAs for significant effects on specific DVs. But again, only if the MANOVA is significant. For each significant ANOVA, we're going to run the separate analysis in SPSS looking for those differences. So we may examine the appropriate post hoc test for main effects if we have three or more levels of the categorical variable, simple main effect tests for any interactions based on the ANOVA um, between the subjects, within subjects, factorial mixture, and COVA. So again, we're basically going to be, once we have that MANOVA, Wilkes Lambda that's significant, we're going to be looking at each ANOVA for each DV. Three DVs, we're going to do this process three times. In APA, we're going to report the omnibus MANOVA Wilkes Lambda, and if it's significant, we're then going to report each omnibus ANOVA F. Stop, you are done with this SPSS output. So once again, remember that when we run the MANOVA, it's simply going to give us these first two areas. It's going to give us the overall MANOVA, and it's going to give us the omnibus ANOVA Fs. Once we have that information for each significant ANOVA, that's where we may have to do post hoc testing, we may have to do simple main effects, and these will be done individually and separately in SPSS for each DV. 
And then with each DV, we're going to report the post hoc and symbol main effects um, and the follow up ANOVAs and any additional testing we need to do. And again, in APA style, what this is going to look like is a paragraph that basically reports the overall Wilkes Lambda, a paragraph that reports the overall Omnibus ANOVA Fs, and then a section for each DV that gets into the details. Again, the post hoc test, the simple main effects, was the interaction significant, etc.